Today's podcast is sponsored by Kari. KariWine.com. Like the native wood. The native New Zealand wood. That's K-A-U-R-I-Wine.com. In case you don't understand my American accent. Kari specializes in organic yeasts and nutrients. They've also got a great Braumeister. More on that in the last episode. Uh, they've got some great barrels working with some fantastic uh, French cooperages like uh, Loire and Sori. Uh, first-hand experience with all that. And uh, if you pay attention to their emails they send you, you can score some used white barrels, which I did last year. Uh, so hop on that. Those things are like gold. Get on it, folks. And with Kari being experts in the industry, they can offer you know great technical support. I've had uh, many long conversations with their sales rep, Dean, who covers Hawke's Bay. And they cover, you know, all of the Australian wine regions and New Zealand wine regions. And, yeah, they got a lot of trials going on, a lot of the latest technology, great tanks, uh, you know, just all the bells and whistles that you're looking for. And a nice eye on organic stuff, too. So uh, they're not just uh, cold-hearted wizards or something. These guys are and they're in it, in it to win it with all of us. So... Uh, what can I, more can I say about it? They're, they're good peeps at Kari. So, uh, yeah, just visit KariWine.com. Pick either the New Zealand or Australian flag. And that's it. Just go to KariWine.com. K-A-U-R-I Wine.com. We're also sponsored by Decibel Wines, of course. The Testify is out, guys. Officially out to the people and it's selling. People are uh, hopping on it. We've got it in two uh, degustation menus at some of New Zealand's top restaurants like Pacifica and Hawke's Bay and Siddharth up in Auckland. I've hopped on it early. Uh, I think hopefully they're appreciating that it's kind of a rare wine, a pure expression of uh, New Zealand Malbec. Not only that, uh, Giblet Gravels Malbec. So, And folks are buying the wine online. We're sending some off to the States this week, uh, a few throughout New Zealand. Uh, we'll probably send some to Australia soon. I'm heading over there this coming week by the time you guys get this episode. So it's moving. It's only about 226 packs available, so hop on it now. Uh, but the difference for you guys is if you use the promo code DB Podcast, you get 10% off your first order. Um, I'm loving that we held this back for an extra 15 months and released it when we did here in the middle of winter in New Zealand. It's been pretty fun to get a nice big Giblet Gravels red out there to the peeps. So go to decibelwines.com to order uh, one of the beautiful six packs we're doing with free shipping. Gorgeous little package. It's now available to ship throughout New Zealand, Australia, the U.S., the EU, yeah, all over the EU. If you're in the EU, we're going to get it to you. Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong, uh, who else am I forgetting? Oh, yes, the U.K. Uh, Brexiters, no fear, I can still ship you wine. Uh, just visit decibelwines.com click shop decibel wines and then choose your flags very easy okay willie d What can I say about Jason Stent? He's a great friend. He's one of the most talented winemakers in New Zealand. I had the pleasure of working with him for four years, four vintages at Paratua. Uh, still hang around that place and get to see him work in action all the time. Uh, I remember a few years back, we submitted for the first time in about six years to Robert Parker's Wine Advocate. And uh, no surprise, the scores and reviews came back were stellar from Paratua. I think when I read that, that was probably the best cumulative uh, review of New Zealand Bordeaux wines that ever. I mean, I think we submitted three wines and they were all sort of 93, 94 plus wines. Uh, and uh, the idea was stated that these wines should be revisited again because they're young babies. And uh, Jason just knows how to make these world class wines. And I was lucky enough to work with him for a while. But. Uh, I don't want to talk too long because Jason and I had a long chat. I think it was more about cycling than wine, but uh, it was a great conversation. We drank some great wine, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Cheers.
fortunate enough to be a part of a few of those blends. So what's the breakdown of the 2015 2112? Good question. Yes. <laughs> my, are we allowed to divulge that? Um, <laughs> I, I can't recall off the top of my head the exact percentage, but I think it's 54 cab sav. Um, 30 or 28 Merlot. No, it must be 28 Merlot. Uh, so what does that get to? 70, 82, you know, I think about mm. 18% Franc, yeah, something like that. It's pretty chewy. Mm. So uh, I just saw another updated list of the top 25 most or more expensive wines in New Zealand, and 2112 wasn't on it, though there were wines that were cheaper that were on it. So I don't know. I need to get the marketing team on that, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah. I think I replied to that tweet and I said uh, that we're we're bespoke and we're under the radar a little bit. And uh, <laughs> you know, we're a bit like a, a, a fine suit. Not everyone knows the name, but uh, they know it when they you know they recognise it when they see it. Oh, I think it's uh, it's a bit ridiculous, and I have no problem saying that I would think anybody who knows anything about wine in New Zealand, you'd much take a Hawks Bay over a Wahiki wine. Mm. I don't know, me, I would, you know, and I, I think there's some great Wahiki wines, but just even just <coughs> style wise, I prefer the Hawks Bay. I don't, they're just a bit sweatier up there or something, you know, and even the, what is it, Clevenden and uh, the Auckland surrounding areas. I just, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you can have gem years up there, but just on a consistent basis. Yeah, I think they do struggle with, um, yeah humidity <laughs> yeah i would think so. so i get a lot more rainfall and uh i'm sure if they're charging you know and i'm not gonna point out any one particular producer but if you're charging that much per bottle like you can throw every bell and whistle at it and you know say it's exclusive and all that kind of stuff but when it really comes down to quality i mean homage is on that list and that's a fantastic wine so that i get that yeah. um but some of the other guys, I'm just, hmm, okay, I wouldn't pay that, you know. But I get the tourist dollar. I mean, that's the bottom line is they get uh, Yeah, it. but if you, when you taste those wines, they're very classical in style and um, very Bordeaux-like, mm. um, but more in the old Bordeaux way, whereas they're a little bit more, uh, less fruit-forward, maybe less tannic, um, or the tannin that is there is more of that really structural tannin that takes time to, to come around um, whereas you know the Hawke's Bay style through the 2000s has become more fruit forward I, I'd say and less um, less uh, classical sort of tannin structured wines mm. we're trying to make wines that are approachable in, in their youth but still ageable and with the 2112, what was the, I mean, the original vision of that wine? Obviously, when they planted the vineyard, they knew they wanted to make a wine at that caliber. Yeah. And that was kind of the mindset, because you were around when they were establishing the vineyard, and you made some of the first red wines coming out of there, right? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, they were making their wines at Sacred Hill, and that's where I was working at the time, and... Um, so I was liaising with their winemaker at the time. And um, yeah, so they had two or three winemakers um, running up to uh, me taking over in 2000. Oh, really? Who else was there? So uh, it was... Um, Everett, obviously. Avert, obviously. Averitt. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, Elise Montgomery. And I think there was somebody else before Elise, but I didn't really... Oh, okay. I didn't um, know that. Yeah. So in those early days, it was very young vines, and so they were just making fruity, soft wines that were going into the Stone Paddock range. Uh, so when Avit took over uh, the winemaking, so that must have been for the 2007 harvest, um, the wines were being made at Sacred Hill. So <coughs> those wines looked amazing, and it was a fantastic vintage for Hawke's Bay anyway. Yeah. Um, and then 08 was uh, another cracker vintage, uh, very different style, um, very similar to what we see in 13 and 14. So really tight acid in 13, really tight acid in 20, 
2007 really you know rich wines um, amazing tannin structure um, the kind of wines that'll age for a long long time and then the 2008s just really approachable mm. soft uh, a little bit more developed in color straight away off the bat um, but probably higher alcohol as well I think the 08s and very similar to 14 exactly the same mm. yeah more developed color but great structure really approachable in their youth and um, drinkable right from the word go yeah uh, so then you were just drawn out of Sacred Hill to uh, go there to a new exciting project yeah well that's that, yeah it was a pretty exciting project a brand new building uh, you know state-of-the-art uh, Sacred Hill was um, you know booming at the time booming yeah it was doing really well uh, we were doing really well with our red wine program. Uh, probably some of, we're making some of uh, New Zealand's best reds at the time, I think. Um, we can honestly say that. Um, the Helmsman and uh, Broken Stone that we were making, um, that I was responsible for, um, I think the 05 and 06 and 04, they in the sort of um, <laughs> blind tastings that they did around the country and around the world um, was often um, m mistaken for Margot and things like that. So, um, so that's very right bank? Margot's left bank. Left bank, yeah. sorry, yeah. Well, yeah it's so mixed up coming Cabernet down dominant. The So the Helmsman should have been the one that, but um, often it was the Broken Stone Merlot that did pretty well as well. But the, um, the Helmsman is the one that got... Um, I think it was always top three and always the first Hawke's Bay wine um, judged at these blind tastings in London and mm. I think they did one in Telpo as well oh James the big, Halliday yeah the and, big uh, Gibber Gravels yeah. versus France yeah, yeah. Well, let's bring it to France actually when did you first go to France um, I, well when I first went to France it was 1991 so I was 20 years old just turned 20 uh, and I was there to race bicycles and for, listen to uh, grunge music. Uh, I wasn't really into grunge. I was into punk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah, right. You're a bit older, was, older uh, than me. <laughs> was my my younger brother? He was uh, a little bit more into the grunge, but that was quite, it was kind of a little bit after that. No, it was kind of a little ninety bit just before the grunge. Ninety two is when it really hit. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, my younger brother used to send me mixtapes of. Um, all the, all the latest music because he was totally into music and uh, he had a great collection of music and still does um, so any music tips I'd just go to him <laughs> but he would send me stuff that I'd never heard of and like he uh, he was a, the first one to send me the red hot chili peppers and things like that um, yeah yeah because I was kind of living like a monk pretty much I was eating training sleeping racing was yeah. Bit, yeah. So cycling was your your whole life then. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I outside of being a boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah, I. You did some work and. I yeah. yeah, I did a little bit of work. Um, obviously, I worked three jobs uh, through the summer, um, and um, when I came home from France, I'd be working three three jobs, training, just trying to make enough money to go back, and um, yeah, but you know, yeah, it's kind of just. Um, it's, uh, it's a twilight zone of your life. You're sort of focused on this one thing, this dream. Yeah. And um, everything goes into that. Um, so, you know, girlfriends and that kind of thing are, um, are a distraction. And um, Women weak in knees. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, like... A, it's a rocky quote. No, it's, well, it's not me. I mean, my personal opinion. Yeah. I I was easily distracted by girls, that's for sure. So, um, and uh, most of us were... You know, young young men with um, a lot of testosterone yeah. floating around, and hopefully natural. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Was um, it uh, how doping at that stage? Was that something that uh, I mean, obviously it was around, but was it something that was oh, sort of pervasive all the way into the the amateur was, uh, and yeah, training yeah. level? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and not just the um, what's the the white blood cell thing you take that uh, EPO. EPOs were uh, that was pretty new 
in those days it was uh, still in its infancy there were guys still dying on start lines because they'd taken too much and their blood was too thick and that kind of thing um yeah no i i had uh, teammates that um were taking stuff um that's for sure and um they did really well <laughs> <laughs> but uh for me i my whole philosophy was um and and i think also you gotta put cycling into perspective um it, in europe it's always been a working man's sport so it's working class it's tough it's hard it's like boxing mm. there's no no um quarter given no um and it's pretty level right the playing field's pretty level by just the fact that equipment is only going to get you so far your engine yeah. is you yeah yeah you're the engine and your mentality as well how, how tough you are mentally uh how you know how many times you can take a beating and get up pretty much um mm. you know you crash in races um the first thing you do is check your bike <laughs> get on your bike start riding again trying to catch and then you check your your, bo your body um, unless it's really bad yeah and uh, obviously you can't get up broken and you can't get up but um you know or unless you're tear gassed <laughs> or is that what it was on this in yeah, the, the tour, the other, in the day, tour yeah. the other day yeah but that was the police trying to protect the riders yeah, uh, yeah they screwed that one up yeah, yeah got it wrong <laughs> but yeah no the the drugs were were around um uh, i think the easiest drug to have get to get hold of would have been um amphetamines sure um, obviously um that's an easy drug uh, i mean that was just, i never really took that was part of like uh, for, american uh, baseball for like since the 40s i think yeah. the 50s like you know those guys play every day and probably go yeah. out a little bit at night and so yeah but you know and that's the thing about cycling is um i think pro cycling once it became once it got into the uh sort of pro uh sorry into the olympic arena um it became a little bit more international, I think. Um, um, America and the English were a little bit more probably um, influential in um, drug testing and all that kind of thing and, and, and having the Olympic Committee involved in, in the drugs that were allowed or not allowed. Uh, so there used to be two lists. There used to be the Olympic list and or amateur list and the pro list. So the pros were allowed to take a lot more drugs than the amateurs uh -huh. um, because it was their life it was their job yeah and so they were allowed to take things to keep them operating because they they only have a limited season they got to keep racing they don't get paid if they don't race uh, it was pretty tough in those days sure and, um, and so was some it? guys didn't have salaries and well some guys did have salaries but they're minimal like f you know it would be the equivalent of a forty thousand dollar salary nowadays yeah 45 you know i mean Scratch race winnings was what got you through keeps you hungry yeah <laughs> <laughs> so was the uh, you know from the u.s standpoint i distinctly remember this because i had an uncle and cousin involved the boom was greg lamond in the sort of mid late 80s and yeah. uh i'm assuming there was some uh english or you know uk as well sort of booming around then uh but obviously it's been part of Europe for forever. Uh, you know, these races, as soon as they were having bicycles, there was races. Yeah. Uh, what about New Zealand? What was going on down, you know, I see millions of bike, you know, cyclists around Hawke's Bay every day and. Yeah, you know. it, it was, um, it was pretty, it wasn't big, but yeah, we were, you know, guys like Greg LeMond certainly inspired us. Uh, but probably the guys that I um, was inspired by more that were English speakers were Sean Kelly, <coughs> who was an Irish rider. No. Probably the best rider to <laughs> never have won a world championship. Uh, and Stephen Roche, who um, he won the Tour de France, and the Giro d'Italia, and the world championship in the mm -hmm. same year. So um, an amazing bike rider. Um, and one of those guys who he had just a brilliant year where he um you know won those three races but he in that same year he had a really terrible crash on the track um and he was a his philosophy was you had to ride the track in the winter um this was my job 
I ride the track in the winter. I ride the road in the in the summer. And I, um, you know, I'm a journeyman bike rider. And mm. you know, I get um, ten years to make as much money as I can. Yeah, there's you're on the clock. Yeah. That's for sure. So he, uh, you know, and he's from a tough Irish background. Uh, you know, he did milk runs in the morning, went training, worked in factories, did an apprenticeship, and then then went to race in Europe, um, and and he did it hard, and he rode uh, for tough tough French teams. He was getting overlooked by his coaches and um, and his team, and you know, putting pushing the French guys forward. So he went out and he won the amateur Paris Roubaix. Um, and if you've seen Stephen Roche, he's a very slender, slim guy who um, is built for climbing. Um, so to win Paris Roubaix, which is a cobblestone classic which is usually sort of big, strong, heavy guys that tend to win that race. Um, you know, a guy like that winning that race just because he's so mentally tough and he wanted to prove a yeah. point, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can sort of see why he won the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia. And just kept yeah. going. Yeah, he's an incredible rider. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned to me before that you, I think, it's on your birthday or you won a race or something and you got – a wine, a Bordeaux that sort of opened your eyes back up to wine at that at some stage. Um, well, we, we we used to win lots of wine all the time because we were yeah. racing around Bordeaux. That's where our team was based. <laughs> um, yeah, but Bordeaux especially. Um, so we were um, our, our team was uh, Merignac Velo Club, so we were based in Bordeaux, right by the airport. Was that planned at all? I mean, did you have? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So um, all the. Um, no, I mean by you though, like yeah. So the cl- the clubs that I wanted to join in France were all in um, wine regions, okay. so Champagne, um, so n- you know near Paris, um, uh, Bordeaux, and uh, there was one uh, down near Burgundy, but um, it was actually more south of France. But um, but there's grapes everywhere in yeah, France. So. Yeah, especially down but, there. But um, Bordeaux was probably the choice for me because I liked even then, you know, <coughs> I loved red wine my youth so it was never really um you know something that i was ever not going to want to go to bordeaux at some stage yeah so So you might as well live there yeah so we'd win these wines um bring them home sometimes we'd push the cork in uh because we're uncouth and (laughs) didn't have a corkscrew and uh yeah no corkscrew and we'd be driving home uh from the race Uh, we weren't allowed to drink obviously but uh, we did anyway because we were dumb kiwis and we were young and dumb and uh, yeah, so we'd push the cork in and share the bottle around, and the guy driving the car would just be incredulous. He'd just be like, "Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> you never do that." <laughs> but we didn't care. But then we'd give away these wines, and um, people would say, "Oh, look, I'll give you some money. Those are really quite expensive wines." And we'd all sort of say, "Oh, it's okay. We'll just win some more next week." And um, the French guys keep the wines, obviously. They 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 knew something, but. Uh, the, there was three Kiwis in the team and we'd just either drink a bottle and then give the rest away or um, yeah so, so do you ever wake up in the middle of the night thinking like shit if I would have just kept <laughs> yeah what I, was I wish giving. I had a photographic memory because uh, it would have been not good, good to know what I gave away but um, you know it doesn't really matter it's, yeah, yeah in the end it's a it's a drink isn't it so yeah <laughs> um, but then you know um, the we we got looked after so well by the French guys and um, and the families that looked after us that um, to give them a couple of bottles of wine. Was there some sort of, you know, pipeline connection <laughs> between, or was it just like a program that you entered to get to be, a, you know, on uh, those teams? In those days, you had to um, be introduced by your federation. So um, our federation was the New Zealand Cycling Federation. Mm-hmm. So we would have had to have um, got permission from them to uh, apply to a club in France or clubs in France mm-hmm. or to the Federation of France, um, Federation of Cycling in France. So uh, I would have sent away my Palmares, which is my race. Um, racing course. CV? Yeah, my racing CV, yeah. the races I've won and the races uh, that I... You know, I've done well in um, big races that I've done well in and things like that. Yeah, so we got into this club and um, 
and it just happened that uh, the, the the guy who uh, owned the club and the bike shop that we did some work at um, that um, the club was named after as well. Uh, well, it was sorry, the club wasn't named after him, but he was one of the main sponsors, so everyone kind of knew him as Jack Shark Swear. So they kind of knew our team as the Shark Swear team, not. Merignac Velo Club, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because we were sponsored by... Um, yeah, yeah, you end up calling uh, what's on their jersey yeah, or, yeah. or so, on. um So anyway, this guy, Jacques Swear, was um, one of the youngest riders uh, to represent France. I think he went to the Olympics when he was 16 to ride on the track. Uh, he was a world champion, uh, an Olympic champion. Um, yeah, just great great rider one of the best sprinters of that era mm. um, but he was so good all round um, they liked him in the team pursuit team so um, I think their big rival at the time was Germany so I think Germany might have beat them in the Olympics and then they beat them in the world championships or something like that but anyway he had all these trophies gold medals Olympic um, silver medals and you know a world championship gold silvers e- everything and um yeah uh so his story was he crashed broke his neck in a car crash uh following a bike race after oh, he sure. had a mechanical um so he couldn't race anymore so he um, became five times um skeet shooting champion of France. <laughs> just, <laughs> so yeah, one of those guys yeah, you know yeah, just, he could, just he put his energy into anything yeah, yeah he was yeah. uh he was an incredible guy so um you know, and really competitive. Um, Clearly, yeah. if if we were say uh, playing Patonk, he would be able to just you know smash us. Yeah. Um, he would be able to put the, the the steel ball right beside the jack every time and smash our ball away. I got, I got a couple um, buddies like that. Yeah. But and but anything. Um, you know, if you're mucking around, <laughs> we you know we you know being young guys, we might be mucking around sort of pretending to box or something shadow boxing each other you know just as a joke and then he'd want to step in and be part of it yeah he'd turn anything into a game everything was always competitive and um, and he'd be like oh you're dropping your guard and giving you advice and always coaching you and it's like okay jack we're just mucking around yeah yeah. (laughs) no no (laughs) he took everything you're gonna do it do it right yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly but yeah so he um you know obviously being a a great rider and uh, he'd won um, lots of wine as well <coughs> in his youth. Uh, he'd been uh, at some race and he'd won it and he got given a magnum of Obreon. Um and there was a photo of him with his son Canoe uh, on the um, top tube of the bike uh, with the bottle and the wreath of flowers because you always get flowers when you win a, win a race. Um, so he's standing there with in this photo with this bottle of wine and um, so this is 1991 it's a family barbecue um, so I'm the only Kiwi there um, from the team the other guy, I don't know where the other guys were um, so Jacques pouring this wine out of the Magnum and um, I tasted it and I was just blown away I just couldn't believe that it was uh, 30 years old so it was a 61 mm. Obreon out of Magnum and uh, yeah I couldn't believe how good it this wine was and that it was 30 years old it was 10 years older than I was and yeah I've I don't think I've he- ever had an experience like that again either but um, that was just uh, it was mind-blowing for yeah, me. yeah yeah so that was my epiphany moment for wine but what I noticed about the wines that I had in France at the time was the similarity to Hawke's Bay and um, so, yeah, for me, I, uh, I sort of the penny dropped, and I thought, well, maybe uh, making wine back home is the is the way forward. So I'm lucky. Not turn pro. So yeah, that's so um, so lucky in that you had that to come home to as well as an option, and that Hawks Bay is is what it is because um, I can honestly say I didn't have that as an option yeah. <laughs> and a lot and most people you know most people in the world obviously don't have that on their doorstep and that it would have been exciting to come back to because um, I was thinking about uh, you know some of the guys that I've interviewed and women that I've interviewed 
and some of them are really young and younger than me and then you know some older guys as well that were kind of pioneers of the area but uh it seems like you would have sort of hit the ground running when you got back what what would that not not so, yeah so i raced in 91 and 92 and um I was actually going back for the 93 season and, um, and I'd learnt a lot and I, I had a plan and um, but then uh, I got into the EIT program and um, yes I started studying wine and um, but yeah so I had to do I was pretty unprepared because I hadn't done chemistry at, at high school and things like that so I had to do all those bridging courses and, mm. and things like that and try to catch up quickly um, but yeah so I did the degree course but I never actually quite finished it so I had you're notes. still you're still studying I'm still studying yeah. yeah yeah well you never stop learning in this game and uh, yeah so I think I had six months to go but I got a job at Sacred Hill and um, so um, the plan was to do correspondence study and just finish it off and it was going to take me a year um, but I think the first year I worked at Sacred Hill I averaged six, 60 we- hours a week something like that yeah <laughs> so well yeah that's what I was kind of was getting to is when you it wasn't like oh what do we do we just like things were happening in Hawke's Bay at that point and there was a bit of an expansion going on and particularly with Sacred Hill you would have been yeah like Absolutely. I said, hit the ground running. There's plenty to do, and just get to work and yeah. get it done, kind of thing. So they uh, set up one of the first contract uh, facilities in, in Hawkes Bay, you know, doing work for other people. So mm-hmm. we were doing doing work for, um, and I guess they continue to do that as well. But we were doing work for they definitely do La Tua, <laughs> um, at the time. Um, who else? Um, I think Geeson. Um, yeah, anyone that was crushing fruit in Hawke's Bay and sending it away, we'd, we'd do all the pressing for them and, and mm-hmm. things like that. So Round the um, clock then if you're doing oh that kind yeah, of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. And those first couple of years, we didn't have the best equipment. And, uh, yeah. Uh, like the, the first full vintage I did at Sacred Hill was 95, and it was probably one of the most disastrous vintages you can imagine. Um, we we didn't really press grapes. We kind of just sieved them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so uh, slop fest. Yeah, there was a lot of additions going on in in those days, trying to just make something drinkable. So I think the 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 uh, triumph from the '95 vintage was that we made some wines that were actually drinkable. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, I can remember fermenting tr- uh, in the back of trucks, um, doing our reds in the back of trucks. It was the we had no more tanks left. Um, so the truck turned up and luckily it was our own truck and we didn't have anywhere to put it so we um, I think we crushed into bins and then tipped it all back into the truck and <laughs> fermented it in the back of the truck and you know that was the kind of stuff we were dealing with in those days but it was fun and it was exciting and um, you know we we worked 23 hours straight um, and get three or four hours sleep maybe five hours sleep if you're lucky and then go straight back into it we'd have breakdowns we'd have all sorts of stuff going on and um you know you learn a lot when you're under pressure like that and um mostly it's a mindset though too that you know i uh i'm often reminded of uh well you know my brother uh i took him to a hot yoga class one time (laughs) <laughs> he's not the fittest guy at the you know this is only a few years ago he used to be really fit but uh not most recently i took him to a, i just i was up in the morning one time and he had probably worked <coughs> at the bar the night before yeah and i said oh, I, I can do it what are you talking about i said all right well come on with me you know and he came with me and 15 minutes into the class he looked at me and he i mean he verbally said i'm gonna fucking kill you right <laughs> but he made it all the way through and you know there was some funny quotes during it i distinctly remember the the um teacher saying to him or instructor saying to him okay if that's as far as you can go that's that's where you're going to be today you know and uh, that's good it's what you know but anyway he got through it and he said and i said man i, I thought you were going to leave you know i thought you were going to walk out and he said he said no i've been through double sessions which is kind of like uh when you're in you know and growing up and playing uh, football, gridiron, American football, yep. you do these like double and triple session practice days and it's just yep. hell. I mean, it's yeah, just, yeah. you're just dirty and you know, it's so hot out, it's the middle of August and everything. And, and it's true, once you've been through that and you 
get mentally over the fact that you can barely stand up anymore like you know vintage mm-hmm. long vintage hours or something it just starts becoming funny and you start yeah. doing weird shit like and humor yeah like real humor. dark and <laughs> and and uh yeah just and i think uh the good places that you work and the good people you work with are always you know at the, some stage we'll sit down and have a good meal and have a good drink and and a good laugh so. yeah and quite often those people you you know you're still friends with because you've gone through absolutely a pretty tough tough yeah. uh, few weeks and, been through um, the fire yeah yeah absolutely I, i've um yeah you know, i found the same was when you know i first left school didn't quite know what i wanted to do other than go overseas and race um so we'd work all sorts of jobs and um so some of the work we did was things like um hay carting and um you know i'd have um josh cronfeld on my hay carting team and he's an all black you know and, <laughs> and he wasn't then but you know he was um, he was studying at uni but he was a machine man and trying to keep up with him it was, you were just letting him down the whole time <laughs> so, and in the end he would just say you guys just you drive the truck you you do this and you do that and i'll just start throwing them and we used to have a machine which would um carry the the hay bales up onto the truck little conveyor kind of thing wasn't fast enough for him yeah so <laughs> he'd just, be yeah, he'd just throw them on by hand he was a he was a beast but um yeah so you know a guy that physically strong um working with guys like that you know you you see yeah and when you're only um 60 uh 62 kilos or something and uh he's like 85 um and most of it's in his arms <laughs> it's pretty um it's it, it's a good character building experience yeah and so um yeah it was sort of all go you know we're kind of hopping around timelines here but you know you s- came full-time over at paratua in 08 or 09 9 vintage uh, yeah end of end of 08 so i think i joined in all, uh, june or august june no it must have been july july of or late july and was it kind of half and half some of the one with the winery built yet or uh the winery was built uh well the barrel rooms the barrel hall and i think we were constructing the tank farm at that stage yeah 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 so um yeah so that all happened uh through the sort of summer of 08 and it was ready for the 2009 vintage um but how how it is now wasn't um how it was then so um there were probably about i don't know 10 or so tanks that were there that are now Mm -hmm. um so we put them in a bit later on so um it was uh just a small project a few years later that we did and i I think you were there when we no it would have been just not long before i joined i must have been just before yeah yeah yeah, so uh, oh, maybe that was 2012 that we put those in. Yeah, I yeah, think that sounds been. right. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, the thing with winemaking is you, you get all these um, different roles that you end up doing, like you become a project manager of, you know, installing a whole lot of tanks and refrigeration and get making sure the timelines are right um, and, and all that sort of stuff. And, um, uh you know you become an engineer you you figure out how to fix stuff because uh so you can't always wait for a technician to turn up yeah um so yeah so there's always things that you're doing um yeah i've probably learned more about other things than than or or maybe (laughs) equal or something but you know how to chase up your pallets (laughs) in, in logistics and you know just as much with that sort of stuff yeah. and how to send a, some wine overseas and then obviously all the stuff i learned uh in the winery and uh being i felt like a lot of times at paratua i was an assistant custodian you know and you were the chief custodian yeah yeah <laughs> sometimes it does feel like you're, you're the general without an engineer on yeah, site i yeah. mean the bigger wineries have and you know chief toilet cleaner yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah with plenty of plenty of work doing that but the uh, yeah, some of the bigger operations obviously either have an engineer on call or have one mm-hmm. pretty much on site. I imagine Villa up the road will have somebody there yeah, when yeah, they're done so. yeah. when they're done building to just for at least for if there'd be a full time position with everything they have going on down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was all go, and then sort of went 
splat. Yeah, well, the GFC, well, it pretty much already started in 08, but um, we we were kind of immune to it in New Zealand. And um, But this company uh, just happened to have a lot of business uh, in the States and they were in, importing, or sorry, exporting to um, Chicago a lot. A lot of their wine was being sold in Chicago and LA, San Francisco. <coughs> and um, the the funding that was coming into Paratura in those days was from um, the Fisher family. Um, so it was, a, it was a couple, Gary and Brian Fisher, um, and they had a lot of business with small banks in the US, um, rural banks. I don't, I don't know. They're probably small in the US context, but in uh, the New yeah. Zealand context, they're probably massive. But um, anyway, small rural banks and. Um, uh, so they were selling them things like um, pens with lights, all that sort of stuff. So they had a business in China making um, that stuff. That swag. Stuff. Swag, is that what you call it? Yeah, I That's don't know what you call it. Um, I can't figure out if swag. We call it landfill here. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> I can't figure out if the term swag came first from junk like that or uh, cheap weed. Yeah because it's used for both and as long as I've known and certainly way back into the 70s so swag you know you hear radio stations giving away swag right which is you know stickers and yeah, whatever yeah. else you know yeah yeah so yeah so they were making all that sort of stuff um and this was before the real you know digital age of um, everything being on your phone and that kind of thing so they had like key rings where you could have um, photos 30 or 40 on photos on yeah, there or, and, um, or maybe you know, little mp3 players and stuff like that or radios and you know just stuff Nick, that knick knacks give, knick knacks that banks could give away as enticements or whatever I don't know I don't know how you use them open an account and yeah, get, a, uh, get a a free back scratcher yeah something like that yeah so yeah so that all dried up so um, they were scrambling to try to um, grow the markets as quickly as possible to um, meet um, you know cash the, flow. the cash flow but it you know it got too hard and too too difficult um, so they sold it and in uh, 2011 a group of uh, Chinese and New Zealand investors bought it Chinese citizens New Zealand citizens and um, yeah, so ever since then, um, we've been pretty much exporting to the China market, a bit to the UK, a little bit to Australia um, for a little while. Um, that's dried up because the distributor went under. But uh, that seems to be par, par for the course in uh, the wine business. <laughs> Small distributors go under a lot. And, and uh, big ones. Kind of like restaurants as well. Yeah, big yeah. ones. It's just a big merger in the states yeah. i'm reading about recently and it's it's uh, always changing and you think you're uh all set to go and i think some of that stuff that's really interesting that you know we are we're obviously always trying to sell our wine and be um uh you know conscious of keeping the wine out there and people interested in it and tasting it but uh often when you're on the restaurant side or the retail side uh you i you know if i'm like talking to those guys or talking to our distributor or something that you hear of the flip side being really scary for them is when these mergers happen that oh we lost bacardi or we lost yeah, you know Ge you know which is there's one in the you know in the states where they lost like geeson and somebody else went to you know big marlboro producers went combined with this other one and these other guys are left in the dust and you don't think about how much people just need products you know they need like wines and if they if that dries up then all of a sudden there's you know thousands of accounts out there that don't need to see them anymore because mm -hmm. you don't give them your Bacardi rum anymore or whatever it is you know yeah. and uh and so there's a little bit of like just keep making good wines and you'll find you know you'll something will open up for you if you just keep hustling um, but man, it is a hustle. I'll yeah. tell you that, you know, totally. um, but you've traveled quite a bit on behalf of, uh, selling wine. Uh, I know you've been to, when was the last time you were in China, by the way? Uh, last year. So we've got a, we've got a,
got Vince on board now, so um, that's take the pressure off a little pressure bit. Pressure off me. I haven't had to go, but the yeah, the China market's an interesting market, and um, oftentimes when you go there, you're not really selling as such or doing too much of the. You're the European work. face. You're just the yeah, the European face or the, the Kiwi face. The Kiwi face, yeah. And um, yeah, so you just have to sort of rock up, smile, and wave, and get some photos taken and. What do you like about it and what you don't like about it? Yeah, I know you like the food a lot of times, right? Uh, I don't always like the food. Um, yeah. yeah, some some of the foods I could <laughs> totally <laughs> forget about. But, um, some of the fermented, uh, blo- you know, uh, stinky yeah, stuff the, or whatever. The fermented, um, what is it, uh, tofu. Ugh, yeah. That's pretty rough. Um, but, you know, I suppose it's a bit like a, um, a really strong cheese or something. But, mm. um, Acquired taste. Yeah, an epoise or something like that, but... Oh, it's probably worse than that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But um, but you you only really see that sort of food in the street markets and, and that kind of thing. And um, and there's like a sort of a twenty or thirty meter zone where it's really rough, and then the, you know it, the smell dissipates after a <laughs> short while, and then something else takes over. Um, but what I do actually like the street food in China. Um, yeah. Lots of barbecue type little. Um, stalls and things like that but uh, when they do something really well uh, they they go over the top and um, their banquets are always amazing and um, if it's a top end banquet uh, it's pretty serious the, the presentations top notch and um, yeah the food is always top quality yeah I've, obviously I've never been or not obviously but I just haven't been and uh a couple things from memory that stand out that you've talked about uh, that I thought was kind of interesting and worth mentioning. One is that, you know, as part of the new China or what goes on in that you don't own land and they sort of relocate all these people from the countryside and just say, well, we've built this <coughs> high rise for you amongst a city of millions of high rise, a city that you and I have never heard of that you know, probably mm. 20 or 30 million people live in or something, that people are still people and they want to, con- they end up all down on the street anyway and all congregating and cooking down. Yeah. They don't the want to be up in the building. Well, they don't know how to use an electric oven or an electric um, cooktop. Yeah. They've always cooked with fire. So, yeah, so you see these beautiful apartments, um, high rise apartments, but yeah, everyone's down on the street doing their thing and trying to raise ducks. Yeah, <laughs> on, the con- on the concrete. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's. Um, so you can't change people. Yeah, or not not that generation at least, and maybe no, the next generation. Yeah, well, they don't know any different. So they've come in from the country. Maybe their um, children have um, bought them the apartment, or the government's placed them in the apartment, and um, maybe their pension pays for the rent of, of the place or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's just really interesting that yeah you see. It. <laughs> And and I think those older people they like to interact. Yeah, the, yeah. There's so people are social yeah. and they're gonna. There's m- maybe modern China with the millennials and the everyone on their phones all the time. They're, they're oblivious. They they're just looking at a screen. And um, like I, I almost never have my phone out when I'm in China. Because you're just I'm head on a swivel. Like, wow, check this you're the out. country bumpkin. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I am the country bumpkin. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh my god, look at the size of that building and. That's like forty stories high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's that wasn't there last time I came here. So where's the main uh, regions and cities where you spend most of the time? Um, so we go to the big cities, Beijing and Shanghai, um, and um, mainly we go to Shandong, the Shandong area. So that's the Yantai, and probably the most famous place would be Qingdao. So that's where. The beer from China comes from, or the most famous beer, Qingdao beer, uh, and it was also the place where the um, yachting was held uh, at the Olympics uh, a few years ago when they had the Beijing Olympics. Yeah. So Qingdao was the the yachting um, hub. Uh, beautiful cities. Um, so uh, Yantai is um, Austrian sort of influenced, and like so just copied or influenced. I know the Austrians. There's were, Austrians that were there, were, were there because they're old colonial then, stuff. Yep. yep. And then Qingdao was more uh, German, so th- 
you go the beer and the, and then the lager beers and things like that the other beer so the um architecture in Qingdao is very um germanic and same in yantai um very germanic or austrian um influence and then you go to shanghai um and it's there's the sort of the bund where there's these big sort of Romanesque, English sort of style um, buildings with big pillars and things like that. So that's sort of English um, and sort of French architecture from what, what do you call it? Post, I don't know what you call it, sort of um, post colonial. Romanesque or whatever. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, so you've got the pillars. I'll call my cousin. Then, he knows. And then the, um, yeah, oh, the triangular. triangular yeah, like and, almost Greek yeah, influence too. Yeah, yeah. Just whatever. And um, old. Old. <laughs> But yeah. uh, not Art I, Deco. No, yeah. <laughs> I should know the name because I I love architecture, so I should really know what it's called. But anyway, I, I forget. We but, can mention it in the comments of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but then you go to other parts of um, that area, the old part of <coughs> Shanghai, and there's lots of French, old style French villas and things like that, and um, and I think they call it. Hutong or Hutong or something like that and they're, they're all sort of one level buildings or two story buildings and um, very narrow narrow streets and things like that and so a lot of those areas are being, being sort of turned into sort of cool bars and, and that sort of thing and um, so you kind of walk down these narrow um, alleyways and bang there's a really cool cocktail bar and, and yeah. places like that so Do you see like a a bigger influence from uh, I'm asking this sort of uh, having my own thoughts on it um, as far as younger people and Psalms coming up and being a lot more knowledgeable about the world of wine and cocktails and you know international beers because uh, yeah. I've seen more probably women and uh, even gay men and things like that that I'm a, you know whether how much influence they had in China in the past I think it was pretty male dominated, probably. Um, yeah, I think maybe um, the business owners are still old guys, you know. But yeah, some a, of the influencers, would you say? A, yeah. yeah, a lot of the younger influencers are probably not that young. They're probably in their thirties, mid thirties. Um, but the appetite for knowledge is huge in China, and people love to get a certificate. So if you go and spend a few hours learning something they want yeah acknowledgement so um so a lot of um yeah a lot of those wset courses are really popular because people want a qualification they, they they're spending this money on this wine they're learning about wine they want something out of it um whether they use it or not it doesn't matter they just want to be able to say that they've got that qualification mm. but as far as um uh, wine knowledge goes they're very lucky because the, the whole wine world is pushing all their wine into China so if you live in Shanghai or Beijing you could taste the best wines in the world every day yeah. and there'll be a tasting on every day There's, you'd, I think you'd get fatigue from the amount of great wine that you could taste and, um, and tastings you could go to and and that sort of thing so in that way they're really lucky and they have a huge advantage uh, probably like the the uh, US was in the 80s and um, you know after Parker sort of really um, yeah and the sort of wave of Italian and obviously yeah. French and sort of that tie to the old world yeah and, and everyone California wants to be wines in or, the yeah. US market all of a sudden um, yeah. yeah so and yeah, like like in America, the the amount of wine, the wines you can get in America, it's it's, it's incredible. Annoying. It's amazing, yeah, <laughs> compared to what we can get yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. So, That's kind of what's annoying about it. It's not yeah, that you can do that in America. But. Yeah. So the the wines we get here um, are really expensive, and it's hard to get a a real good picture of a region based on just the wines that are available, and our market mm. um, so if you're doing um, an MW or a master sommelier and the guys that have done it in the past uh, man they must have committed a lot of cash to do that and a lot of time and 
you know, hats off to those guys. That have yeah, they didn't have the Corvin back then yeah, either. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, th- I think um, the Kiwi guys that have done it in the past uh, have, uh, you know, uh, they've done it hard. Um, but then, you know, talking about China, um, those those young guys and girls that are coming up and, yeah, the knowledge that they have is mind-boggling. It's, yeah. um, they're very, very good at um, extracting every bit of um, information that they can. And, um, and th- they'll ask you questions sometimes that... <laughs> You're like, whoa. You're kind of like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me get back to you on that. Yeah, yeah. You need to do <laughs> so, some research. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really uh, it's really good. It's really challenging when you when you meet people like that. But then a lot of a lot of the stuff you have to talk about is, you know, pretty boring. And um, mm. But you've also mentioned that some of your cooler experiences there have been with other winemakers and you know, uh, visiting some of their, um, not so much that you love their wines necessarily, but that there's a knowledge and a thirst for it uh, in that realm too. And we've had some obviously visitors come to yeah. Paratua over the years. I, th- I think um, one of the things that I, I've always liked to do whenever I travel is I don't like to go to all the touristy areas. I like to go where the locals go. And um, so if I have downtime and, and I'm by myself I'll hunt out areas that are, that seem to me to be very authentic and, and local mm. and um, and in China it's pretty safe I mean you know you, you could get mugged but I, it's not likely yeah um, and you're less likely to turn a corner into a bad neighborhood would you say or yeah, yeah that's it's just um, not gonna happen the, yeah the Chinese are pretty polite people overall kind of like the Japanese they you know just um you'd have to be doing something pretty bad to um mm. to um a little to, more conservative to, yeah to get um beaten up or whatever or just be in the wrong place at the wrong time which happens but um yeah my experience has been that when you sort of hunt out these little um places um that are off the beaten track you can have a really good experience and um eat something or taste something that um is legit amazing. yeah legit but, yeah just but you don't know what it is yeah yeah <laughs> so you gotta take a photo and get, get it explained to you later and then <laughs> when you get it explained to you you probably didn't want to eat it in the first yeah, place you didn't but, know what you know. I, what did i just eat <laughs> yeah. yeah so um but yeah uh so i've got a bit of a, a knack for finding a bar in china so that's my sort of um superpower mm. yeah your superpower <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah and i i kind of like um i kind of like bars that are sort of lowbrow i suppose i don't really like too many high high end cocktail no, places yeah, yeah. I, which actually that's a lie i do i really love them but um yeah i i, I have this knack of finding quite really cool bars that are sort of just I think almost I, like a speakeasy yeah place authenticity is, yeah. is probably yeah. the word even if it is a little more high end it's authentic maybe it's been there a long time mm-hmm. yeah. and they made these cocktails or they do you yeah. know you're always looking for that type of yeah. place um and and the, the funny thing is you know we don't have you can't get uh, facebook or twitter or any of those applications in, in china so everything's in chinese that you're looking for and um it's uh, yeah, it's just really funny that um, it's almost by I don't know. It's like divining. You just kind of sniff things out and then I oh, go down this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, then, that's the way it used to happen. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when I li- you know when I lived like in Brussels or outside of Brussels. Yeah. Uh, or when I traveled around, even you know we traveled around in the states with the band back in the days that you did you just kind of asked around or yeah. uh, you know at least then you got some english but you know you just kind of get a feel for like this this street looks like something's going on down yeah. here yeah, uh, exactly. what's going on over yeah. there? these houses look a little more interesting okay yeah. what's happening down here yeah just sort of let your nose follow your nose you know yeah absolutely and um yeah so that's my uh, my superpower when it comes to um china anyway um 
Yeah, so and also um, taking little risks and opportunities when they when they present. Um, so one of the good experiences we had um, as a group of Hawke's Bay winemakers in, in China was um, this Aussie guy said, oh, I've got this little whiskey bar that I run. You guys should come and check it out after dinner or after your event. And so, yeah, we all went our separate ways, but um, I got everyone together to say, yeah, let's go to this place. And um, I was the last one to arrive, so I was um, using the WeChat app to try to tell everyone where it was and take a photo of this place, and they were all in there already. And um, they were like, yeah, no, we're, we're all here, come on down. And um, I was like, come on down. <laughs> okay, so we went in, the elevator goes down to the car park, uh, we get out, there's just cars everywhere, and then this, and it's pretty dim, mm. and um, so we look across and yeah, there's this light sort of shining in the corner, so we walk over there, and yeah, and next thing there's this whiskey bar, and uh, and the funny thing was, it's also like a golf driving range, <laughs> <laughs> but um, how, how the whiskey bar worked was you, um, you, you join the club, and whenever you travel, you just bring back a bottle of interesting whiskey and you put it in there. And if you're part of the club, you get to drink anything and um, whatever's on offer. So um, this Aussie guy had invited us there as a group to, um, you know, partake of all these fantastic whiskeys. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. And uh, and they just had all these amazing um, old... Um, whiskey adverts and things like that and they had videos of whiskey of course, adverts it'd be playing the, it'd be the same for uh, spirits as it would be for um you know wine that everybody wants their um boutique or even you know their uh, high-end spirits get over there single bourbon yeah single barrel bourbons there was uh, amazing stuff and yeah so and this guy he knew his stuff and um I had uh, some pretty pretty nice whiskies and um, bourbons as well that night, and um, I learnt a lot. Um, but yeah, I think the the thing I learnt the most was the those single barrel bourbons. Yeah, you I love pick bourbon. Them, but it's, there's a banana Easter note to them mm. pretty much every time. I don't, and I'm not afraid to say that I like a bit of sweetness to go along with the sort of uh, some of the scotch. You know, I probably would need to spend a bit more time with scotch to really appreciate and there's some single malt stuff and i've had some yeah. scotch nights that i thought were pretty fun <coughs> but uh bourbon the uh yeah the aged bourbons are pretty fun yeah you know just that hint of sweetness in there from whether it's the you know toasty american oak or whatever it is or there's actual sugar in there um uh, i i possibly i like that and uh obviously love to go home to mccrossins to taste what they're pouring you know, much like their beer list, the uh, spirit list has gone into, you know, there's the classics there still, you know, you still find a Bombay Sapphire behind the bar, but there'll be some gins and whiskeys and bourbons and stuff that you've never heard of and uh, from all over the world. So yeah. it's just the way the trend is going. So uh, Yeah, so I guess we're sort of reverting back to the 50s where we're all going to be drinking cocktails and... Uh, mm. That'd be pretty cool if we could be uh, like Mad Men. You know, we can have martinis at lunch and stuff. Well, speaking of which, this uh, 15, 21, 12, I just keep filling up my glass. Uh, uh, very, I would say more so than the 13, very drinkable young. So. Yeah, but um, that acidity is really, it's really showing at the moment. So um, it's going to be a keeper, this one. Mm. Oh, like all, all yeah. the twenty-one twelves are anyway, but um, I think this one's somewhere in between the thirteen and the fourteen in, in approachability in its youth. But uh, the nice juicy steak, it's still going to be mm. a pretty good drink right now. But this won't be released uh, for a little while. Yeah, Early bottle now, age so. is nice to yeah. do. What? Uh, so what's the latest? I mean, I sort of know what's going on over there, but if you had to sum it up and uh, where things are heading with Paratua, it's <laughs> always seems like continuously to be because of its history uh, a winery and producing wines that are somewhat well bespoke is what you said but under the radar and sort of not always around everywhere you go though they're pretty easy to find you can go online and yeah. order some wine it's, it's pretty easy to find nowadays but uh, it seems like the nature of that place and if there is a spirit around that place it's that it's somewhat 
at arm's length in that sense. Uh, there's talk of a tasting room at some stage, and there's, uh, you like know. To talk. Yeah. Like to talk big. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> a little more distribution in New Zealand now yeah. uh, with a great company, so we're seeing yeah, the wines so around a yeah. little more. Yeah, right. So we've got Mineral on board, um, or we're on board with Mineral now, um, which is great. They're a great company, and uh, we're really looking forward to um, um, developing the New Zealand market with those guys. Um, as a winery and vineyard, we're in, in um, conversion to organics, um, so we're going to be planning to be fully organic by 21, I think, 2021. Yep, should be. Um, well, you're, you're, uh, going well. this, this podcast will have posted, uh, the pr- week after I post, uh, my interview with James Milton. So, uh, in a timely fashion with, he was just up in Hawks Bay for a family of 12 tasting. And we were, we were talking about, uh, I can't remember if it was on the podcast <laughs> or before or after about, uh, a little bit of excitement around finally around organics and Hawks Bay and being a bit more progressive in the vineyard and getting a little farther away from that grower mentality of or just straight up farmer mentality of just get a crop and you know get as much as you can and as opposed to we're trying to make wine out yeah, of this yeah. you know not just grow grapes absolutely so I mean that's always been my philosophy philosophy with reds is especially I mean whites you can get away with a little bit more cropping but um, obviously because you, you need juicier sort of wines but um, with reds yeah you, there's no shortcuts you've got no. you got to crop it low get that concentration and um, yeah be authentic about it and um, you know I'm just kind of going jogging the memory of previous podcast and how it relates because so many times I mentioned Paratua and my experience over there um, you know one thing we've talked about is the clones of Cabernet over there and how uh, the difference between the bridge paw soils and the Gibbet gravels so I did you know like a whole series on the Gibbet gravels yep. uh, and that wasn't too uh, particularly the amount of work I've done on in bridge paw with a bunch of different sites to take anything away from bridge paw because I've multiple times put a bridge pa, particularly Paratua, but also some Malbec uh, wine in, in a Gibble Gravel strictly winemaker's hand, and then they taste it and they go, oh, you guys can do that. Like, we can't do that, which is, yeah. you know, sort of fleshier, you know, mochas and, you know, fleshier fruit, I guess, is the way to put it, you know. Yeah. No, you can. You can in the gravels, but it's just how you manage the tannins. So, um, you know, some guys in the, well, I, I can't really say because I don't really know, but um, it seems to me that some some of the gravels winemakers take the wines off skins too soon. Mm. So you haven't got that really nice um, integration of the tannins with the fruit before it goes into barrel. Yeah, certainly um, Jenny doesn't. <laughs> no, Jenny wouldn't, no, for sure, no. Um, if, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If Jenny keeps the wine um, on skins longer, than, you know, less than twenty-one days, that's pretty. That's unusual. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, man, I've learned so much off her over the years. She's yeah. such a great winemaker, and uh, she's such a wealth of knowledge. Um, yeah, man, we're so lucky to have her in Hawke's Bay. Um, yeah. So I guess the difference would be that that tannin structure between the the gravels and the the bridge par triangle. Um, for me, the bridge par soils, particularly on the red gravels, um, maybe not so much much on the ashier sort of stuff on top, um, but where we are, those really deep red gravels, um, I think what we're getting is a really nice savoury note to the wines, uh, beautiful aromatics, but the tannin tends to be very chalky or powdery for me, whereas the... Um, um, the gimlet gravels tannins tend to be a little bit more angular, a little bit harsher. Uh, they need time to yeah, integrate yeah, yeah, in, definitely. into the wine. Um, when when I was making the wines at Sacred Hill, um, we did lots and lots of aerative pump overs, um, long macerations, um, particularly with Cabernet. Um, Merlot, 
it would depend but nothing would be on skins less than 28 days um, with Merlot mm. uh, Cabernets could have been up to 40 days on skins um, I wonder I'm just thinking I wonder if uh, and, but very young vines in those days too so. you're starting to see it's a combination of things but with the giblet gravels being uh, what it is and that it's kind of all about the trademark and the soil <laughs> those two things are what bind that group of random wineries all together obviously mm. that they're all there but uh but that that what is that association as opposed to bordeaux or grand cru or whatever other classification you could come up with and uh a lot of the wine writing around say the annual vintage selection and even just the gibbet gravels overall is that it's like without a doubt these are great wines and they're world-class wines and they're and they're in this classic style and all that but it's what is going to punch out from the group and in being a group there has been a collective move to the middle a little bit and mm -hmm. a lot of the the writers i've noticed particularly in the last two sets of abs reviews have been okay what's going to be different and if you really read between the lines of what they're writing and what wines got chosen they're they've pulled out some weird ones that you go, oh, why did they choose that one? Because I think this one's really good too. Why did they pick that one over that one? And it's, I think they're trying to, um, because they're an outsider, um, uh, write it, or score something higher, whether it's Andrew Callard who, who picks the actual, you know, gives his advice on which mm -hmm. wine should be picked. Uh, they're looking for something different. Now, if you get a lineup of Bridge Powell wines, just the nature of the fact that it's a bigger region there isn't that sort of tight-knit group of an association the wines are a little more all over the place and in a good way you know like there's you know Paratua is completely different than the Tarawa mm -hmm. different than Alpha Domus you know where um you know going through some Giblet Gravels tasting sometimes you could get confused on to who's who yeah you know because there's a bit of a stylistic thing there how much of that has to do with the soil as it has to do with the association and this you know, what is a quality Hawks Bay, Bordeaux blend or Syrah is probably up for question. And I think, I hope that with, uh, you know, that the, you know, that there will be, I, I'm trying to push it a little bit, even just the fact doing Malbec. <laughs> but I, I think what's cool about the Bridge Pa is, uh, you know, you have Ash Ridge is over here and Paratua yeah, is over and, here. And, and Ash, the Ash Ridge soils are quite different to where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I think they have more ash yeah. in, the, in the soils. Um, but it's still deep gravels underneath, but I think they've got a little bit more topsoil than we have. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, right across the road, you've got Tiawa, which is on pretty Both. much one side <laughs> of the driveway. It's more or less Bridge Bar Triangle. And then the other side, it's... Um, it's Tiawa soils, yeah. Yeah, Tiawa soils. And then is... Are the hillsides that overlook I don't the think bridge they are. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the, the Gibbet Gravels, are they part of the Gibbet? I don't they're think not, they are, no. no. But they're uh, they're sort of their own little appellation, yeah. you know, which is probably another reason why uh, Balancia wines are such standouts is because they're really different mm -hmm. than, than everything else that's out there, you know? Yeah. Well, um, when, I, um, when I was at Sacred Hill, one of the um, interest, most interesting... Um, experiences I had with um, Syrah was we were buying the Gimlet gravel section of Syrah at the bottom of the hillside from Cyprus and um, we would do two or three picks through there because we had uh, really gravelly sections and then we had the wash from the hillside where you'd have these um, uh, sort of flows into the across the rows. It's kind of like clay -ish. Clay, very yeah. clay, yeah, lots yeah. of clay. And the best wine came from those clay sections and they were the juiciest, most aromatic, mm. um, best tannin. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, don't know why, but uh, for whatever It could whatever be the combination reason, of the both, you know. Yeah, yeah. but... It was, it was deep, deep clay. It wasn't oh, yeah, like yeah, just yeah. a little bit. On yeah, the we're top. talking thousands of years of yeah, wash. A, a long, long time. Yeah, so, yeah. but um, 
you could see it. You'd walk down a row and then there'd be these bloody triffids growing. <laughs> and then the rest of the vines would be quite low and um, mm. you know, struggling. Um, so those struggling vines would pick early. Um, they'd be riper early, but they wouldn't have the same concentration as the later picked stuff that was growing on with deeper, richer soils, um, offering something else. Mm. Um, but when you put them together, those um, those vines that were grown on the clay, they just lifted everything in those stonier soil wines. Um, but they combined so well with the tannin from the gravelly soils um, that you just had this complete wine. But you had to treat the, the vineyard or each could even just be bays, you know, two bays, then one bay, and then half a bay. And it, you might be um, hand picking around one vine, <laughs> but you could taste it. If you take, if you walk along the vines and you, you taste them, you could pick. I mean, this one, this one, we, you know, we will not be picking this. We'll be picking all around, everything yeah, around yeah, yeah, yeah. today. Yeah. Well, but that type of stuff is, uh, it's what makes those are the difference between making a great wine and like, yeah, that's pretty good, you know, because yeah. uh, it's the same thing with, you know, hand sorting as close to the pick as you can and things like that. Or, you know, because once you mix it up, you can't unmix it. Yeah. You know, it's like it's yeah. done. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that may have been that one vine, but there were one vines probably in 20 different spots or something. And then those will be picked later or something. Yeah. So, but you, once they're in, you can't get them out, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, well, cool, man. When you find that in the Gimlet Gravels, anyway, you get oh, you get breeds, lots of breeds, and, lots yeah, of breeding, yeah. and um, yeah, and that actually, um, you'll find that some of those siltier soils, if you can hang them out later, you get so much more richness out of the wines as well. So. Who who do you think has the more siltier sites on the, from your experience on the gravel? From memory? Uh, from memory, Sacred Hill definitely did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just where we were. Uh, not all of it, but uh, down towards through the through the Syrah section and um, part of the Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm. Um, but I think what we did in those days was once we figured out um, what was what, they um, changed the irrigation um, drippers so mm. that the richer soils were getting less water and the, the bonier stuff was getting more water. So water. Hot topic these days. Mm. In Hawke's Bay, it is. Yeah, yeah, particularly for the Gibbet Gravels, it's going to be real interesting to see where that all lands. Just went to another meeting about that last week. And, uh, and then you have uh, James who said to me, again, I don't remember if this was on mic or, or before or after, that, you know, if uh, <coughs> all, with all those rocks, the Gibble Gravels could grow some great microbes on the cool side of the rocks that could assist in the vines. And I thought, okay, James, well, we need to get you down to the Gibble Gravels because <laughs> there's nobody talking like that around here. Everybody's just worried about irrigation at the moment. So, But I suppose through composting and things like that, you know. They're, well, they're, Kingsley Tobin... Um, was organic in the early days mm. and uh, he was making some beautiful wines I'll tell you what at that ABS tasting and I, w I really want to get him on the podcast Dermot's wines have just turned a yeah. corner at Stonecroft they were tasting mm. ridiculous really yeah. good silky and to the fact that everybody at the end was kind of asking him what's going on what are you doing? He's and a magician. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's called. You know, I think it's. That's commitment. It's yeah, commitment, it's, and um, it's it's thick skins and uh, yeah. and healthy vines and happy vines and things like yeah. that. So. Yeah. And he's done it tough for a few years because he, you know, he's had to turn the vineyard around. Mm. Um, yeah. No. And and I think. Uh, no disrespect to Ellen, but um, you know the the vines were old. Yeah, yeah. Time. They just needed a like a youthful, you know, a bit yeah. of youth, and not that he's the youngest guy or anything, but yeah. a little bit of a fresh look at things and um you know i think he's done a great job of carrying on that and taking it into the next phase yeah and to go back to that association i would say without a doubt that is the most valuable thing is that we have that tasting and we have those discussions yeah, once a year it was such a good atmosphere yeah. and good questions and everybody was so cool and you know it was my first time going to that tasting and not that i haven't had that 
general experience at most Hawks Bay tastings, but just to have that many great growers and winemakers in one room, you know, you guys down from Auckland and Mills Reef and yeah. uh, just a ton of experience in the room. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, probably the best thing to come out of that association is that collaboration and what do we do as a group and uh, and maybe, you know, when now you have Mission, who has a history with organics and they have a block that there are a few blocks that have kept it and you know paul mooney who f admittedly said i don't you know i wasn't convinced in the beginning but now i am is that you know was, i think we were talking about a cab franc site that was run organically that he just absolutely loves and um don't get me started on cab franc man yeah <laughs> and uh obviously villa maria is committed to uh organics i think till yeah. 2020 or 2021 they should be fully organic so yeah, which is great you know that that's that's where i think they're going to enter the game and um again going back to the conversation with james you know all the grand crew you know french wineries are moving in that direction because they see the value in their land how many italian yeah. wineries is it's have, called it's I've never been conventional yeah I've always been it's yeah. value you know and, and that conversation was coming up at the wa those water meetings is you know what's going to happen when the water gets turned off and you say well you can't do dairy on the, say for bridge pa or something you can't do certain crops on this mm. so now you own this block of land yeah and all you can do on it is really grow grapes on it mm. so i think one of the concerns is that a lot of the rootstocks that they've used for planting have uh, quite shallow rooting rootstocks, but I don't know how much of that is because they're getting irrigated all the time, and yeah. so they they tend to give them a up. chance. Yeah, 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 stay up quite high. Um, because when you look at um, some of the rootstocks that are used in Bordeaux, which they don't have ir any irrigation, um, it's one hundred one fourteen three three oh nine, same as what we've got here yeah, in yeah. RG and things like that. So. Um, and they get deep roots over time, but it takes a long time to do it. I think, uh, I don't know, I just think um, you're keeping your, probably the good metaphor, a fitting metaphor is you're keeping your, you know, the head in the sand or, you know, is because you're not, yeah. which is actually what you should be doing is looking down into the ground to know that, you know, we don't need to be irrigating as much. And the fact is, is we're not gonna be able to. So you yeah. might as well. Well, one of the, um, I think, you know, with there's a lot of really, really um, talented and very knowledgeable people in New Zealand. Um, and one of the guys is Damien Martin, and he studied in Bordeaux. He's a Hawke's Bay boy. He studied in French. He did a, his doctorate in viticulture in France. Mm. So that's how big a brain he's, he's got. He's committed. <laughs> but he, he started the Vineyards of Ara, and... Um, down in Marlborough and his whole philosophy was when you irrigate you irrigate as if it's a rain event so it's more natural and, mm. and that kind of thing um, so um, which is in tune with what Mark Krasnow is saying right yeah yeah, yeah. but um, you know you know these guys like that that have got these great ideas and um, they're just ahead of their time you know yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know we're all too Maybe Marlborough's not the place to do it because it's Sauvignon Blanc and you need a lot of water because mm. it's kind of like, it's almost like growing bloody, you know, um, almond nuts or something. You need <laughs> a huge amount of water to uh, to produce that um, particular aroma and whatever it is they've got down there. Um, but, yeah, those guys, you know, if you could tap their brains, <laughs> be... Yeah, well, that's what really I would good. be talking to so, if, if uh, yeah. and I, I, um, obviously you're doing what you can do at Paratua, but um, I keep joking around with Mara to say, you know, it's coming around, it's coming around because growers are approaching me to say, like, well, what do you think, you know, do you want any of this fruit? And I just, my first thing is, is do you have any interest in transitioning to organic? And yeah. I hope that some of the other youngish or sort of, I guess we're middle getting into middle age now. Winemakers are uh, are well, saying the same thing. Oh, nice! Must be uh, all those years of uh, 
those winnings on your cycling that you can retire <laughs> on has just been gaining interest, yeah, you know? Yeah, those three bottles. Yeah. 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 Um, well, cool, man. We just did an hour and 20. I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, we'll probably leave it there since we poured the last like of the... Sounds like lunchtime at Paratour. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we just poured the last of the wine, so... Um, uh, well, it's, a, you know, a good bottle of claret should be shared, mm. so... And two people is the perfect amount, so... Yeah, we'll look forward to uh, opening up some more with you over harvest. Definitely. Coming year. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, thank you, Jason, for doing that. That was great to speak with you. Uh, Paratua.com for all their wines. I am at Decibel Dan on all the handles. I'll be in Australia this week. Hope to do three podcasts in three days. Back soon. Cheers.